today's reaction is going to be something a little bit different. This tagline is the tragic tale of Aaliyah. I wanted to know about Aaliyah because obviously a lot of you have given me contrasting views about uh, parts of her life, etc. and everything that led up to the, that tragic event that day. So I think it's good to educate yourself about artists. I'm going to start doing this more in the future because I want to know what, what artists are like behind just the music. If that's something you'd like to see, then let me know in the comments and just like maybe even give me an example of someone I need to watch a documentary on. Anyway, this is the tragic tale of Aaliyah. Let's check it out. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to this, but I'm not at the same time because we know, obviously, uh, that what obviously happened tragically that ended her life. Right, okay, let's have a look. Good morning. Right. Oh, sorry, you're welcome. Thank you. Aaliyah Dana Horton is nothing short of a pop culture phenom rising to prominence in the late 90s and early 2000s. Mm. She sold millions upon millions of records, starred in Hollywood movies, and was nominated for five Grammy Awards all by the age of 22. Wow. How wow, that is a lot of accolades, especially for someone so young. I mean, I only, I, I only, the only film I know she's been in, that's because I've been told, is Queen of the Damned. And I believe that was her last film, wasn't it? Um, I might be wrong on that, I don't know. But I mean, them sort of accolades, like, uh, wow. Oh, okay. Let's let, let's. Just... Nominated for five Grammy Awards, all by the age of twenty-two. However, the success came with a price. From being exploited by family, groomed by her musical mentor, and ultimately losing her life while trying to further her career, this is the tragic tale of Aliyah. We could do it all night. We could go all night. All night. Do we heal? Do we bleed? I'm a fella, yo, leave. But we could go all night. In 2001, Aaliyah had been in the music industry for eight years and in that time achieved great success, selling around 30 million records worldwide. Her success can be determined by a number of factors one being her image, another, her connections in the industry, but most importantly, her incredible talent. Oh, that sounds good. The one I gave my heart to. I'll have to write that down for a reaction. Aaliyah had an innovative, forward thinking approach to her music and helped shape RB forever. I think the biggest compliment I can pay towards her music is if some of her discography was released tomorrow, it wouldn't sound dated or old fashioned. Okay. Her legacy can be seen to this day. That with her tracks being sampled a number of times by the biggest names around in the present day. Really? Such as Drake and The Weeknd. Oh, I say that's two, that's two artists I've not really listened to. I've, I think I've got one reaction of Drake and I've got one reaction of The Weeknd. And I've also got the AI of Drake and The Weeknd. <laughs> so... Wow. Wow. However, it's not only musically she made an impact, with countless references to the young star in top musicians' lyrics. Got a bitch that's looking like Aaliyah, she a model. My only regret could never take Aaliyah home. Okay, shout out. The reason Aaliyah was able to achieve so much and make this level of impact by 22 is because her journey to become an entertainer started at a very young age. Always having an interest in performing, Aaliyah performed at school shows, weddings, and was even in the church choir. She grew up in a family of entertainers and musicians. Her mother, Diane, was a vocalist, and her aunt, Gladys Knight, wow. was dubbed the what? Empress of Soul Music. I didn't know that. I didn't know. Um, I didn't know her, her auntie was uh, Gladys Knight. Whoa, whoa! It's got. It's in the blood. Was a vocalist, and her aunt, Gladys Knight, was dubbed the Empress of Soul Music. Mm. I know that this song. relationship would I don't know a lot about Gladys Knight, but I did know that one. Be vital, as it was through Gladys that Aaliyah was able to get a leg up in the industry and start ah, making right, okay. connections. Yeah. Gladys Knight, however, wasn't related to Aaliyah by blood. She was a part oh. of the family as a result of being married to Barry Hankerson, oh. Aaliyah's uncle. Fair enough. He is the founder of Blackground Records, and when Aaliyah was just 12 years old, signed a record deal with the label and began recording her first album. 
However, so I mean, there's a family connections of obviously having the musical artist, and they're not blood related, as I just found out. But you've also got people who run the record company, which also give her a boost, etc. And the fact that, yeah, okay, okay. I mean, she's insanely talented anyway from the two songs that I've checked out. What should have been an incredibly exciting and positive period in time for Aaliyah is now forever scarred by the events that would occur. Aaliyah's uncle, Barry, was the man who introduced his niece to R. Kelly in an attempt to help the creative process for the Young Stars yeah. debut album. R. Kelly wouldn't only... Well, well, we all know about R. Kelly, don't we? I'm not going to say anything about it. I'm not promoting that. He help but play a major role in the creative process, producing and writing the majority of the work on the album. Some critics even claiming it was basically like listening to an R. Kelly album, but with a little girl singing. The album was released in 1994, when Aaliyah was just 14, and as debut albums go, a roaring success, selling over 3 million copies, and the lead single, Back and Forth, climbed to a top 5 position in the charts, showcasing wow. a new rising talent in Aaliyah and adding to R. Kelly's long catalogue of musical successes. Right. R. Kelly's musical ability has never had to be questioned. No. His morality and character, however, is another matter. Ah. Do you like... Teenage girls. When you say teenage, how are we talking? Shouldn't even have been that sort of quest answer. Sorry, shouldn't have even been that sort of answer. How how old are you talking? Do you know what I mean? He knew what the interviewer was asking, but he was skating round it. Girls. When you say teenage, no. how are we talking? It's claimed by many insiders that during the production of that album. R. Kelly, 27 at the time, began having sexual relations with the 15-year-old Aaliyah. Woman who says she was sexually assaulted by R. Kelly when she was a teenager said that she also personally witnessed him sexually assault R&B star Aaliyah, who was underage at the time. The pair in question always publicly denied the claims, but there was no denying their relationship when court documents revealed that the two were in fact married. When I seen, I seen. Um this certificate and this a little bit this story on um the missus was watching an r kelly documentary on netflix i caught I only caught a bit i didn't want to watch it um but i caught a bit and i saw this bit saying that he was married to an underage girl but i didn't know it was Aaliyah at the time because i'd i walked out the rooms like i'm not watching this uh etc but i mean it was Aaliyah. okay okay when it came to sex, it was sex to Robert. If a girl was in a room and she had a big booty, she had a big booty. Go. The truth about R. Kelly, that's what it was called on, on Netflix. If she was 15 or 20, she had a big booty to him. Period. From sources within Kelly's team, it's believed that R. Kelly had gotten Aaliyah pregnant. And in order to legally give permission for her to have an abortion, the two had to be married. The only oh. other adults able to give the same permission were Aaliyah's parents. So, R. Kelly had members of his team bribe officials in order to gain a fake state ID, claiming Aaliyah was 18. Not long after the incident, a... Yeah, so there's a loophole there. So if it comes out in court, oh, well, I thought she was 18. When on the underhanded side of it, he knew. Was it a fake? Oh, my God. <sighs> Naming Aaliyah was 18. Not long after the incident, a, what I can only imagine, frightened and anxious Aaliyah returned to Detroit That's... and made her family aware of what had happened. They quickly had the marriage annulled and Aaliyah made it clear she didn't want anything to do with R. Kelly and even asked for all records of the marriage to be expunged in 1997. Once I think one of the of... saddest things about all of this was how public the whole situation was and it was just allowed to happen. Her abuser was just allowed to hide in plain sight. Literally, the album they collaborated on was called Age Ain't Nothing But A Number. And guess who? <laughs> oh, that's not funny. But the fact that it's called that, it made me... Oh, it's cringe as well as... Wow. Really? After all that, he brings now what called Age Is Nothing But A Number. Fucking hell. 
Right. Literally, the album they collaborated on was called Age Ain't Nothing But A Number. And guess who that is lurking in the background of the album yeah. cover? The public and the media can't even plead ignorance. Kelly also found time to write and produce top 10 hits for his teenage bride, Aaliyah. Everybody seems to think that y'all are either girlfriend or boyfriend. Let's just get the record straight. You better go give me a white Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> they were bringing attention to it, but only viewing it as gossip rather than the sickening, traumatizing, yeah, life-altering crime that it was. What was the situation between you and ex-producer Robert Kelly? That was a rough time for me to be honest and be real, for me to get through a very tumultuous period, but you know, I got through it. Going through something like that would understandably- And that's coming straight out of Aaliyah's mouth. You know what I mean? A tumultuous period, but you know, I got through it. Going through something like that would understandably be near impossible to overcome mentally and would ruin a lot of people. However, Aaliyah's star only grew in the coming years. She started collaborating with producers such as Timberland and Missy Elliott, and two years later would okay. release her album One in a Million, which sold over 8 million copies. I was taking some time away and from the... It takes that 3 million and puts it in and, and blows out the water, doesn't it? Okay. One in a Million, which sold over 8 million copies. I was taking some time away from the recording booth, Aaliyah decided to pursue a career in acting, starring in the 2000 action crime thriller Romeo Must Die which was generally well received by critics, with many saying Aaliyah was a natural. This was all working towards her goal, which she held from her from being a little girl. still yet to see that. Just... I have watched quite a few Jet Li films, and I've yet to see Romeo Must Die. I'm, I'm, I'm going to watch it. This was all working towards her goal, which she held from her from being a little girl. I just want to be known as an entertainer, you know what I mean? I want to be looked at as, as an amazing performer, and it hasn't changed, and so far... I'm realising it and making it happen. Mm. While she was thriving in her career, on a personal level, the events of 1994 would of course still affect her. Yeah. She was able to open herself up to other partners, one of which being in 2000, with American entrepreneur and co-founder of Rockefeller Records, Damon Dash. Publicly, Aaliyah would avoid any questions directed her way about R. Kelly, but it appears it was also the same behind closed doors with Dash revealing in an interview that she wouldn't even speak to him about her abuser. Well... The most she ever said was, that is a bad man. I well, you know, maybe she doesn't want to be reminded of it. And people... What happened? What happened? What happened? You can't... You don't want that shit, you? You don't want that. You don't want... It's... No. After a five-year break from releasing her own music, Aaliyah released her third album, self-titled, in 2001 which would peak at number two on the Billboard charts. After a successful lead single in the track More Than A Woman, Aaliyah and her team flew out to the Bahamas to record a music video to the follow-up single, Rock The Boat. Okay. Aaliyah, however, would there's never a, return home. Yeah, I, there's a few people on the channel who've told me about this, that this was the last video. I mean, it's, it's such tragic, because you feel like you're watching the last minutes of her life, don't you? You know, when you've, you're watching that video. It's uh, I didn't know that before reacting to it. You know what I mean? Otherwise, I'd, I'd probably... And I'd probably watch the video a little bit different. The plane crash that killed a rising star. Singer, actress Aaliyah is killed in a plane crash. Dearest, sweet Aaliyah, I have trouble accepting the fact that you're gone, so I won't. It'll be like we would for a while without seeing each other. On the 25th of August 2001, Aaliyah Dana Horton was pronounced dead. She was one of nine passengers that all died when the plane plummeted to the ground just minutes after taking off, landing only 200 feet away from the runway itself. Wow. Aaliyah's death was of course a tragic loss. And what makes it worse is that this wasn't just some freak accident, but the result of severe professional incompetence and ignorance. Really? It's really? Wow, okay, I'm interested in this now. I just thought it was a tragic uh, accident. But the result of severe professional incompetence and ignorance. It's believed the primary factor for the crash was the aircraft being severely overweight, with a mix of luggage and passengers resulting in the plane being 320 kilograms over its maximum capacity. Wow. Really? One charter pilot claims he overheard Aaliyah's team arguing with the pilot before takeoff regarding the aircraft being overweight 
but the R&B singer's team insisted they fly and that they had to be in Miami Saturday night. Oh. The pilot, relatively inexperienced and a new recruit for the company, gave in to Aaliyah's team and went ahead with the flight. Oh, I, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I don't care who it is, whether they're famous or not, if I was something to do with that airline, well, like the private plane or whatever, I'd be like, I'm not flying it if you're going to put a lot on there. I'd have just walked off. I'm not flying it. Sack me. I'm not bothered. I'm not I'm not doing it because if you uh, it's okay when your plane's a massive jumbo jet, right? Okay, it's got a certain amount of weight it can carry. That's a little plane. You can't a little plane with 320 kilograms of too much weight in there. That is a lot of weight for a small plane to be over. Wow. Okay. Recruits for the company gave in to Aliyah's team and went ahead with the flight. So it could have been avoided. The pilot's name was Luis Morales and he became a pilot the year prior to his death in 2000. Research after the crash revealed that Morales was in fact not qualified to fly this model of plane. What? Furthermore, he had fraudulently gained his licence by logging hours upon hours of fake flying hours. So just oh to clarify, God. the pilot was not authorised to pilot this particular aircraft and had gained his FAA licence fraudulently, but that was not all. In the autopsy report following his death, Officials found traces of cocaine and alcohol in his system, and the company that hired the pilot received a warning in 1999 for not drug testing their pilots. Wow. Wow. Now now the story's unfolding. You've got the pilot who's high. Well, it might not have been high, but he's got it in his system. He's not, he's not um, qualified to fly the plane. He's got a fake license. The plane is overweight. It's an accident waiting to happen. Jeez, there's a lot of factors here. I just thought it was a plane crash. This could have been avoided. And the company not drug testing people and then having the warning and then doing it again and then this happens. What happened to the company? I hope they tell you in this documentary. And believe it or not, it gets worse. What? Reports have more recently come out that Aaliyah wasn't even conscious when entering the plane and was carried on by her team. Kingsley Russell was 13 at the time of Aaliyah's death and helped out working for his family's taxi firm in the Bahamas. Right. While speaking to a music journalist and author of Baby Girl, better known as Aaliyah, claims the artist, known by friends and family to not be a keen flyer, refused to get on the plane and was given a sleeping pill by her team after right. complaining she had a headache. After passing out in the back of the cab, her team carried her onto the plane, ultimately resulting in her untimely death. Wow. Losing a talent like Aaliyah. I, I understand that. I'm not a good flyer. I don't like flying on planes. I uh, spend uh, most of my time on the very, very uh, on edge. Let's put it that way. And I normally take some sort of gaming device, like a, a, a PlayStation Portable or a, a DS or something, to try and take my mind off it. Resulting in I, her untimely yeah. death. Losing a talent like Aaliyah mm. so soon would have always felt like a tragedy. But the fact it was in circumstances so avoidable just yes. makes it feel significantly more devastating. Mm. Now, over 20 years on from the incident, we're soon expecting a posthumous album from the late great R&B superstar, with her uncle Barry claiming the album will be released in January 2022. This comes not long after her full catalogue became available in streaming services in 2021. Which... Right, so this is, a, this is an older documentary. Did that album ever get made? Because obviously it's 2023 now. Did it ever get made? Let me know in the comments. Which was received with mixed reactions. Of course, many fans were pleased to be able to hear Aaliyah's catalogue through their preferred streaming service. But the music was put out against Aaliyah's estate's wishes. Really? When the music was published for streaming, Aaliyah's estate put out a statement regarding the issue, saying they've had to endure a 20-year battle behind the scenes to protect Aaliyah's legacy, essentially attempting to prevent her work being profited off by the wrong people. Right. However, Barry Hankerson, who owned the rights to his niece's music, managed to establish a distribution deal with Empire, which allowed for the music to become available on streaming services. Mm. Hankerson's latest endeavour is Unstoppable, Aaliyah's posthumous album. Something about this release just doesn't sit quite right with me. With the previous controversy surrounding the release of her music after she's passed, and the timing of this posthumous release so many years on, feels like a few someones are just trying to line their pockets. Which is a shame, as I'm sure the music will be enjoyable, and will have some exciting features from the likes of Drake, Snoop Dogg, and a single with The Weeknd which is already out. 
If I'm totally honest, I'm still not quite sure where I sit on posthumous albums as a whole. But with this one being so many years on, mm. and coming at a time when the powers that be can finally, after 20 plus years, legally release the music, yeah. it feels particularly distasteful. Mm. Yeah. Again, and it, it was against the wishes of people as well. Hmm. I get that. I get why it comes across as being distasteful. Okay. Legally release the music. It feels particularly distasteful. One of the things that make me happy? Yeah. Work. My work makes me happy. I've been doing this all of my life, literally all of my life. And to do it, be successful, and enjoy it. Mm, I can't say there again. are times when I, I sit back and I look at, you know, my career in a whole and the things that I've achieved, the things I've been through, and I say, wow, you know, I am truly blessed to wake up every morning and do something that I love. There's nothing better than that, you know. You got to love what you do mm. to want to do it every day. And I've had a lot of success, you know. I've got dual careers now, and sometimes I'm like, wow, you know, this is amazing. Is it real? Is it, you know? Absolutely. And, and it, I'm, sometimes I'm taken aback, and I'm just like, you know, dang, I can't believe it. That was the tragic tale of Aaliyah. She left a huge footprint in music, fashion, and pop culture, and her legacy can still be seen today. Made so impressive by a young age becomes even more admirable, considering the amount of strength it must have taken to overcome the alleged abuse she had to go through. The injustice yeah. she had to suffer all the way through to her untimely death has now even continued over 20 years after the fatal plane crash, with her work being released against the wishes of her estate. Whilst I don't support the release, I hope Unstoppable does her legacy justice yeah. and she can finally rest in peace. Mm. I've been Scott. Thank you for watching. Wow. Okay, so that was an interesting insight into Alia's career. Um, the things that I didn't know about with R. Kelly and whatever. I didn't realise that was Alia when I saw it on the, the documentary of the the Netflix thing that I saw, well, a snippet of it there. So. But I mean, yeah, she's put... She, Aaliyah had got so much going for her in her life, you know, musically, uh, the the TV thing, the the films, etc. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of bad stuff in there as well, obviously with uh, R. Kelly and stuff. You know, it's can't not it can't not um, affect you mentally that at all. And I don't blame her for for shutting up shop when every time somebody asks her about it because it's you know if you don't want to relive it and you don't you don't talk about it. But, I mean, the circumstances that led up to a death of that plane, I mean, wow, how many different factors were there that could have been avoided? That's, uh, that's terrible. You know, it's negligence. It's um, negligence not just from the team, from the people who run in the airline, but from the people who are supposed to have vetted the pilot and stuff like that. You know, it's, uh, it could have all been avoided, 100%. And when you see it in that, I, when you see it like this, it's, you start to think that's a tragic waste of life, hundred percent. The only saving grace is at least she didn't know it was happening because she was knocked out with sleeping pills. But that's not, I mean, it's not even really a saving grace. It's just at least she wouldn't have known it was happening. That's it. I mean, fucking hell. I was. It was quite rough. It was good in places. It was tragic in places, and then it was also like uh, made you a bit angry with the R. Kelly side of it. But yeah, what did you guys think? Let me know in the comments. Uh, what other artists should I do documentaries? documentary reactions on let me know in the comments anyway if you like my videos then please hit like and subscribe and i shall see you all in the next one